Okay. Well, it looks like we have quite a few people have joined us already. So I'm going to go ahead and start tonight and want to introduce again, this is Anteater Wellness Wednesday. This is our first year official anniversary. We started this out of the Alumni Association as a way to reach out to our alumni to give them interesting topics during our virtual life. And we have, um, we did them monthly through June and now, or excuse me, we did them weekly through June and now they are monthly. So they're the, um, generally the fourth Wednesday of the month, but uh, this one we moved up a little bit because next week is uh, Giving Day and that's a university-wide giving opportunity. So um, today we're moving it up. So next uh, Anteater Wellness Wednesday, we make sure you join us next um, month at the end of May. So tonight we are having this event is sponsored by our Anteaters in Pharmacy chapter. And each of these uh, events are sponsored by one of our chapters. Our chapters are an opportunity for alumni to get involved with the university in a volunteer format. And it's an opportunity to give back with your time and uh, awesome networking opportunities, leadership opportunities. So we'll talk a little bit more at the end about that. So I'm going to right now kick it off to my colleague, Meredith Kwok, who uh, is the Associate Director of Alumni Relations for the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. And she's going to introduce our special speaker tonight. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you, Wendy, and congratulations on your one year anniversary. <laughs> it's amazing how something that, you know, we thought was just for a short period of time can really stick and take us through the whole year. So thank you again for having us. As Wendy said, my name is Meredith Kwok, Associate Director of Alumni Relations, representing the Anteaters and Pharmacy Alumni Chapter. And as you may or may not know, the very new School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Science was established just on June 30th of 2020 um, when the UCI regents approved the new Department of Clinical Pharmacy Practice. So our department is led by founding chair Alex Chan. It has nine faculty members and we are currently making offers to the first PharmD cohort that will join us uh, in fall of 2021. So it's a really exciting time for us. Um, I hope you all recognize and will celebrate with us. It's a very pivotable moment for the growth of our school and the addition to the UCI Samuel A. College of Health Sciences. So without further ado, I would like to introduce one of our new clinical faculty members and guest tonight, Dr. Carrie Hurley Kim. Dr. Hurley has been a pharmacy educator since 2014 and has worked with PharmD students and residents of all levels of didactic and clinical education. Her academic areas of interest are ambulatory care-based topics such as immunizations, asthma, COPD, HIV, and self-care. Additionally, Dr. Hurley has taught public health related courses for pharmacy students, and her current research focuses on vaccine health equity, as well as assessment of pharmacist patient care services. So I know uh, <laughs> the world and current climate has changed multiple times since we booked this date. So thank you, Dr. Hurley, for being uh, very fluid <laughs> and at the top of your knowledge, and we're thrilled to have you here. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction, uh, Meredith and Wendy. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so this presentation I'm, I'm really excited about. It is not going to be a comprehensive clinical overview by any means. Um, I really wanted to focus a little bit more on how do the vaccines and the pharmacist role in the vaccine campaign fit into um, more of the big picture of public health. So I am a pharmacist by training, but I do also have some background in public health and I work with um, the public health department here in Los Angeles County and city um, in parts of the, um, the vaccine rollout here. So um, I wanted this to be a little bit different than a lot of the webinars that are out there. I know, you know, if you need information about how the vaccines work or how well they work or how to use them, um, 
there's so many uh, resources out there with that information. So I wanted this to be something a little bit different. Um, so I wanted to just start by looking at, you know, the very big picture, and that's our global epidemiology. So just as of um, late last week, we did cross uh, globally a really grim milestone, and that is um, 3 million COVID-19 deaths worldwide. And of course, because of um, reporting and um, record keeping deficiencies, it is likely that this number is actually significantly higher. Um, as you can also see from the chart on the left, um, worldwide, the pandemic is nowhere near over. So cases are, you know, almost as high as they've ever been. Um, I know it's easy living, you know, in the United States and especially here in Southern California where cases are very low. It seems like life is really getting back to normal to be tempted to think that, you know, the pandemic is winding down, wrapping up. But worldwide, that's you know simply not the case. Um, in the United States, yes, our cases are much lower than they were several months ago, but we do have some um, hot spots, particularly in the developing world, which is especially concerning from the perspective of the stability of the healthcare systems in these countries. So Brazil and India, in particular, are seeing. Um, really significant increases in cases, um, and it's having a pretty devastating effect on their healthcare system. So um, the chart on the left just compares several different countries um, that are, you know, kind of in the news, as it were, when we talk about global epidemiology. So Brazil being, you know, um, just really hit quite hard, and India, um, you can see that uptick in deaths where um, that is you know, just barely starting to follow a very large increase in cases. Um, even in terms of the United States, um, I don't think that it's fair at all to say that you know, we are on our way out of COVID-19. Um, in 2020, COVID-19 was the third leading cause of death. Um, and this only included about the first uh, 345,000 deaths or so. Um, so that's not including the other, you know, the next 300,000 that have happened in 2021. Um, we also know that it's likely that there were um, more deaths related to COVID-19 here in the United States even than are being included in that count. Um, the reason that we know that is there has been um, uh, there's been a 15% increase in the age-adjusted death rate compared to 2019, um, and there have been over there were over 500,000 excess deaths, so deaths you know uh, above and beyond what we would expect in a normal year in 2021. So there's about 150,000 deaths that are not um, attributed directly to COVID-19, but very likely had something to do with that. So I know one thing that um, we hear sometimes, you know, is that uh, things like suicides were increased because people were forced to stay at home and loss of jobs and things like that. But um, there actually were fewer suicides in 2020 compared to 2019. Um, so I think it is uh, very reasonable to say that, you know, uh, uh, the vast majority of those excess deaths are likely attributable to COVID-19. Um, and as you can see from the chart, we are, we are not near zero cases here. In the U.S., so in fact, we're heading right back towards um, you know the level that we were at during the summer peak, which of course is nowhere near um, the peak that we saw over the winter, but definitely um, a large number of cases still um, occurring daily in the United States. Our global vaccination progress, though, so um, to kind of flip the script and um, think about what is. Uh, happening in response to the pandemic. So we do have a number of countries who are doing quite well in terms of their vaccine campaigns, and the United States is one of those. Um, Israel has been leading um, you know, almost since day one, uh, the UK and actually Chile in, um, in South America um, has had a, a very effective vaccine campaign up until now. Um, the others that you see there tend typically countries that um, have smaller populations, which are a little bit easier to um, vaccinate a small population as opposed to a very large, diverse, um, spread out population. 
Um, in the United States, we have vaccinated um, about 50% of our adults with at least one dose. Um, and for our adults over 65, this number is um, over 80%. So this is a very large share of our older adults have um, received at least one dose. Um, in California, this number is about 52%. Um, and I'm sorry, I meant to mention too that nationwide, we do have about a third of our adult population are uh, fully vaccinated. So this is people who have received either one dose of the Johnson & Johnson or uh, more likely two doses of either the Pfizer or Moderna, the mRNA vaccines. Um, we are giving about uh, 3 million doses per day on average for the last month or so. And that that's a lot of doses, um, a lot of people being vaccinated every day. We are um, just about, I think, at the point where supply is beginning to meet demand. Um, I know that in my clinical practice, uh, for the most part, the patients I see who want to receive the vaccine, we are able to schedule them a very close appointment um, to receive the vaccine. So we're getting much closer to that um, supply equaling demand. And what that means is, you know, we're going to have um, some additional work to do going forward to reach those people that we haven't reached already. Um, vaccination in the United States is now open to anyone over the age of 16 who would like a dose. Um, and then you can see there just a comparison of the states and their vaccination rates. Um, and this is the share of the total population, not just the share of adults. So that's why the numbers are just slightly different than um, the numbers that I'm reporting here for adults. Um, I do also, you know, feel very proud to point out that pharmacists and pharmacy technicians um, have been really the, the key professionals who are there at every inch of the last mile between, um, you know, when the vaccines are distributed and when they actually reach a patient's arm. So we are there um, in terms of procurement, we're there in terms of storage, dose preparation, uh, patient clinical screening, um, and even actual administration, of course, of the vaccines. And that does include pharmacy technicians in many states now as well. Um, in a lot of instances, pharmacists um, and pharmacy technicians are operating independently, meaning they are covering that entire last mile on their own. But of course, in a lot of settings, we're also acting um, in, a, in a very interprofessional capacity. So um, a lot of mass vaccination sites, we're going to be working right along our, um, especially our nursing uh, and other medical staff, our physician colleagues as well. So um, I think pharmacists have a lot to uh, be proud of and that we can offer a lot of professional independence um, and also a lot of flexibility in those roles that we're able um, to fill. Uh, just a quick kind of comparison, and of course this is um, very far from being all of the information that's available regarding these vaccines. Um, I included the two mRNA vaccines that we've had the most experience and heard the most about, and then also the um, Janssen, Johnson & Johnson vaccine that has been in the news more but um, not uh, been uh, utilized quite as much yet. And then I also included Novavax there. This is one that I think may be a leading competitor to be our next um, vaccine for emergency use, author use authorization. Um, so you can see there the kind of comparative vaccine efficacy between the four vaccines. But I think it is um, extraordinarily important to point out that we can't directly compare these head to head. So none of these trials included more than one vaccine. Um, all of these trials were done in different populations at different points in time, often uh, different geographical locations. Um, the, especially the Janssen, Johnson & Johnson and the Novavax trials were done when we had some of those uh, new variants in existence. So I don't think it's fair at all to say that the mRNA vaccines are more effective, that people should favor those in terms of efficacy. I think all of these vaccines are going to play and are playing a very critical role in um, the, you know, the vaccine effort overall. Um, what we do know about all of these vaccines is that they are very, very effective against preventing serious disease and preventing deaths. So we have yet to see um, in a published trial a death in a vaccine group. Um, of course, we do have cases now of vaccinated individuals who have been infected and have, um, have died. But these are very, very few and far between and much, much lower risk than in those same um, 
a similar population who had not received the vaccine. Um, in terms of doses administered there, you can see we've leaned very heavily on Pfizer and Moderna. Um, we've had about 8 million doses of the um, Janssen, Johnson & Johnson vaccine administered here in the United States. Um, and, you know, more likely more vaccines, more information, more doses to come. Um, I do also want to touch on vaccination equity. I think this is a really key um, component to ending the pandemic. So as we've learned, you know, every step along the way with COVID, um, the things that affect our underserved populations, our lower income communities, our um, underrepresented minorities, those things will all eventually very heavily impact all of us. So it is incumbent and it is um, important to all populations that we vaccinate all populations. Um, and you can see the disparities here. So the gray bars in both of these charts um, represent the number of, or the percentage of each of these populations in the population as a whole. And then the colored bars represent the share of vaccines that those groups have received. So you can see our white non-Hispanic, while they are our largest group, they have also received a disproportionately large percentage of our vaccines thus far. Um, sim uh, conversely, our Hispanic and Latino and our um, black populations have received disparate, um, disparately less uh, in terms of proportion of the administered vaccine. So um, this really points out the need to um, reach out to these communities um, to help ensure that everyone is receiving equal access, um, equal communication, equal education about these vaccines so that we can promote equal um, or equitable confidence and equitable ad administration of the vaccines among all of our populations. Um, just to give a little bit of an idea of, you know, what's going on with our COVID vaccine efficacy in the wild, if you will. So um, these numbers show the cases and also the deaths um, in two particular weeks, one just before the vaccines were rolled out and one um, very recent. So just um, a couple weeks ago in uh, early April. Um, so what we can see from this is that, yes, cases and deaths are much, much lower um, across the board in all age groups in the United States since um, mid-December, of course. Um, but what we also know is that in our adults who are over the age of 80, and this is um, both our group that was previously most heavily affected in terms of um, deaths in particular, um, and also now is one of our most heavily vaccinated age groups, they have seen an extraordinary decrease in the number of deaths over this period of time. So down by 99.9% .9 compared to December. And I think this is a really important indicator of the effectiveness of these vaccines outside of clinical trials. So this tells us that in our most vulnerable patients, when we vaccinate them, um, you know, these really are life-saving, life-giving vaccines. I also really want to um, highlight that the vaccines that are available here in the United States are still considered to be overwhelmingly safe. I am going to go a little bit into the um, clotting issue with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that's being investigated, but I think one of the, you know, biggest messages that we need to carry out to our patients and to our um, communities is that these vaccines in all likelihood are very, very, very safe, um, very effective. And the, you know, the risk of side effects is far outweighed by the benefit of disease prevention. So in terms of safety um, and particularly specifically this, uh, the clotting issue with the Janssen, Johnson and Johnson vaccine. So um, what we know as of now, or as of last week is that there were six cases of, um, of a very specific and very rare type of blood clot that happens um, in the brain and is also associated with low platelet count. Um, this was reported again in six people who had received the vaccine um, within the previous two weeks. Um, all of these cases were in women essentially of childbearing age, um, but in putting this into perspective, you know, we had administered at that point almost 7 million doses. Um, so this 
is a one in a million side effect. Um, however, what we also know is that this rate is um, likely to be quite a bit higher than the background incidence, meaning, you know, what would we expect in this particular group of patients had they not received the vaccine? So we know the rate um, that we noticed in those in that short time that Johnson Johnson vaccine was being used, that this rate was somewhat higher. Um, what we don't yet know, um, or what has not been discussed in, in the public sphere, is whether there is a true causal link. So do we think, you know, um, within the within the realm of, you know, statistical significance, do we think that the vaccine is truly causing these things, that there's, there's very little uh, probability that this is due to chance? Um, we also don't yet know for sure if the vaccine will resume with um, recommend uh, restrictions or new warnings. Um, my suspicion is that we will resume use of the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Um, and the reason for that is that the the risk that we're seeing, if this is a true indication of that risk, is much, much lower than other things that we, you know, that we accept as being, um, you know, that we acknowledge as being acceptable risk. So for example, the risk of this particular type of blood clot in patients who use oral contraceptives is up to 400 per million. So much, much higher than one per million. Um, we also know that the risk of this, this specific type of clot in COVID-19 infection is uh, about 200 per million. So the, the risk benefit here is, you know, it, it, if these numbers are the true numbers, um, is very likely to pan out on the side of the benefit far outweighing the risk, um, especially when we acknowledge also that, you know, there is a much, much higher risk of other types of blood clots with COVID infection, lots of other um, risks that come along with infection. So if this particular very rare um, event is a true risk with this vaccine, perhaps we'll see warnings that, you know, uh, or a warning attached to this vaccine or recommendations that it not be used in this very specific population. But I think it would be, um, it would be very unlikely that we will, you know, just do away with the J&J um, &J vaccine altogether. Um, another thing that I wanted to bring up is hesitancy. So I think as we get closer to that inflection point of some supply and demand, um, we are going to start to have more conversations with vaccine hesitant patients. Um, and, you know, it, even if you're not a clinician, vaccine hesitancy might be, you know, present in your, in your family or among your social group. Um, and I think it's something that you don't have to be a clinician to discuss and to address. And we actually have evidence to suggest that um, peer recommendations and peer experiences are much more um, powerful in terms of you know, changing someone's mind who may have questions or concerns about the vaccine. Um, so just kind of in general, some things um, that I think are important when we talk about vaccine hesitancy is to, to acknowledge that it is normal. So I don't think that there's anyone who, you know, the second they heard a vaccine was available, decided 100% that they were going to get it. I know I certainly didn't. I wanted to find out more information. Um, of course, you know, I went from that, that um, position of wanting more information to getting more information and making the decision fairly quickly. But I think that, um, you know, if we normalize hesitancy um, as something that, you know, many people go through and should go through, um, it doesn't need to be, you know, um, uh, you know, something that that divides us, right? Um, also really important that vaccine hesitancy is multifactorial. So there are so many different reasons that different patients or different people might have concerns or might be hesitant to get vaccinated. So, um, you know, it might be a very different conversation in, um, you know, with a, a suburban, you know, educated white patient who has read some conspiracy theories on the internet compared to, um, for example, a lot of my patients who are, you know, undocumented immigrants who are unsure that, you know, they are even eligible to receive the vaccine if they're undocumented, or if they go to one of these mass vaccination sites, will that impact their immigration status, or um, will that, you know, put them at, at risk of deportation? So these are all, you know, very specific and very different concerns that different groups have. 
Um, also important that vaccine hesitancy is a spectrum. So it's not that somebody is either hesitant or they are not hesitant. Um, we will have patients who will outright refuse the vaccine no matter what. Um, those patients, I don't even know that I would really consider them to be hesitant. Um, the patients that I consider to be more hesitant are those that may resist the vaccine, but they are willing to hear more information or they just have questions about the vaccine or maybe they're ambivalent. Um, you know, they're just not sure what to think about the vaccine. Um, we also have patients who are, you know, they're accepting, but they're not going to seek the vaccine out for themselves. If it's offered to them and it's convenient, they may accept it, um, but they're probably not going to spend, you know, hours on the internet trying to find an appointment. Um, and then, of course, we have our patients who are more motivated and, of course, those that are very enthusiastic to receive the vaccine. Um, so patients can fall anywhere along this spectrum. Um, and, of course, on the other side, things that vaccine hesitancy is not. So um, vaccine hesitancy is not the same thing as being unvaccinated or under vaccination under vaccinated. So there are lots of different reasons that people may be not vaccinated. And those issues, those could have to do with um, access. It could have to do with um, education. So not there are patients who, who genuinely may not know that they are eligible or that the vaccine is indicated for them. Um, so it's not always a question of hesitancy. Um, and then, of course, there are hesitant patients who will go on to get vaccinated. So every hesitant patient is not going to be a patient who never receives the vaccine. And I think that's really important um, key point to keep in mind. And then, of course, that vaccine hesitancy is not fixed. So in many cases, patients can be moved along this spectrum. So if they are, you know, they have questions and concerns and we're able to address those questions and concerns, whether they are clinical, um, whether they have to do with eligibility or um, other questions, if we're able to move them along this spectrum towards the you know, side of being more accepting or more motivated to receive the vaccine, um, I think that's, that's the, the best case scenario. So, so a patient who is hesitant today um, is not necessarily always going to be that way. And um, you know, I always will literally make a note in my patient charts if they will, if they you know, are not willing to receive a vaccine or make an appointment on one visit, I'll leave a note so that I make sure to bring it up with them again later on. And very often it's a matter of, you know, the number of times that they hear about it. Maybe they have a friend or family member who's had a positive experience with the vaccine um, that changes them, uh, changes their, their position and makes them more willing or accepting of the vaccine. Um, the last little piece here, and this is one where we have very little information at this point, but it's it's been in the news a bit. Um, and this is the idea that the COVID vaccines might be helpful for patients who have um, what we're kind of terming long haul COVID, uh, meaning that they continue to have symptoms um, in, in many cases, months and sometimes many months after um, the infection you know, is thought to have resolved, they're no longer contagious, but they're still having symptoms. And you can see here the, the list of the most common symptoms. Um, so, this information does come from a preprint. So this is not even yet peer reviewed, but it has been talked about a bit. Um, it's also very exciting information. Um, if it does, you know, turn out to be um, helpful for these patients, because as of yet, we have really found very little that can help to speed the recovery for our long haul patients. So um, what this, uh, you know, relatively small study found, so these patients were matched, um, only about 44 vaccinated patients um, matched with unvaccinated patients. And they did find that there was a, a marginal but notable um, increase in the percentage of patients who did see some improvement in their symptoms compared to those who were unvaccinated. So one um, kind of uh, response to this information has been, well, you know, maybe those patients had just started recovering um, and, you know, time was what helped them, not necessarily the vaccine. Um, and I think the, the thing that makes me think that that is not necessarily the case is that there, we did see more worsening of symptoms actually in the unvaccinated patients. So not only did we see improvement in the vaccinated patients, we did see some increased level of worsening of those symptoms in the unvaccinated patients. So this 
is an area where we still need to do a lot of research. Um, I would not necessarily, you know, start talking to patients who have long haul disease and say, you know, if you have the vaccine, of course, you're going to get better. Um, the vaccine is still indicated for those patients, um, regardless of, you know, whether or not we think it will help to improve their symptoms. Um, this particular study was actually meant really to look at the safety of the vaccine in those patients to make sure that it didn't make symptoms significantly worse. Um, so we do believe that the vaccines are safe and necessary for people who have been infected in the past, whether they, you know, had symptoms or not, whether they recovered quickly or had um, some of these more long-term symptoms. Um, but I think it will be really exciting to, to see further studies in this area. Do the vaccines really help to um, address uh, or reduce symptoms? Um, that is all the slides I have, and I'm hoping um, that I did save a good amount of time so that we can have um, some kind of question and answer discussion. Um, you know, there's a lot of this information that I am very excited about, but I, you know, of course, I know there are probably topics that, um, you know, might be front of mind for others that are different. Um, so I, I would love to take any questions that you may have at this point. Thank you, Dr. Hurley Kim. Um, and thank you also for letting us sort of take you on this uh, road show in the, I mean, you joined us this summer and, and you have given so many presentations and I really love the way that you communicate um, these topics that may be uh, foreign to some, difficult to understand, scary. I just love the way that you have a very down to earth um, way of sharing this information. And just when you thought you knew it all there's more oh, yeah. to learn <laughs> yeah i'm yeah i have thought about little else besides covid vaccines for, <laughs> for several sure. months because every day there's something new studies information questions so. and personally i really appreciate that the first comment that you made is that we are still very much in this pandemic and it's so easy to forget that especially i mean personally i i've had a vaccine and you think okay am i done is that it? So it's a good reminder for us, you know, to keep in the back of our mind every day. Um, okay, so we, as our, our questions are coming in, we'll give our audience a minute to type. I'm wondering if you could give us a little information on what the dissemination process has been at UCI. If we have had a vaccine clinic at the Bren Center for a number of months, where have we been and where are we now on campus? Yeah, so the um, the mass vaccination clinic at the Bren Center has been, you know, very steady presence on campus. Um, until recently, it was pretty much limited to weekends. Although, you know, we were administering sometimes up to I think the the highest day we had about thirty eight hundred doses administered, which is a very large, you know, number of doses. So, um, you know, it's not quite as substantial as like Dodger Stadium doing, you know, their 12,000 doses a day. But um, for a, a university based site, it is very substantial. Um, and in addition, the clinic has been growing. So we are now um, not limited only to weekends. Um, we've opened up to more of the, the general public beyond, um, you know, the, the UCI family. So we're now operating, um, I believe, five to six days a week um, and doing a couple thousand doses a day. Um, and, you know, I, I have to really uh, uh, champion pharmacy involvement because the... Um, there have been a couple of pharmacists who have been very highly involved in the logistics of, you know, the making sure that no dose is wasted, that, you know, every patient has a dose. Um, and I think they've just been wonderful at coordinating um, that effort. And, you know, we've also been involved with administering the doses and um, really uh, interprofessional collaboration with our nursing colleagues, a lot of medical assistants from UCI Health, um, pharmacists from other areas. So um, it's really been a, a really special team effort, something that, you know, I, of course, don't, um, don't have <laughs> positive things to say about COVID, but to be able to experience something like that is a, is a, a professional privilege for sure. Absolutely. And just solidifies that we need to keep um, educating our new generation of health professionals yes. as well. So many hometown heroes at UCI. 
Um, okay, so we have a few questions actually in the on the topic of hesitancy in um, pregnant women or women wanting to get pregnant. Um, what is the research saying about the vaccine in pregnancies and, and also effects on the mother or the baby okay. after having the vaccine? Yeah, so um, I think this is a, a relatively easy question to answer. We have seen um, no significant safety signals with regard to pregnancy with any of the vaccines so far. So um, pregnant women were not specifically included in the trials, although there were a number of, we believe, unintentional pregnancies that did occur during the trials. For the most part, these were very equal among the placebo group compared to the vaccination group. Um, we also have now had, um, you know, close to five months experience with the mRNA vaccines used in pregnancy in the public. So um, after Pfizer and Moderna were given emergency youth author authorization, it did not take very long before we began recommending the vaccine for pregnant women. So pregnant healthcare providers were actually some of the first people to receive this vaccine. Um, most of them received it, you know, with no hesitation or very little hesitation. Um, from that real world experience, we again have seen no major um, concerns with regards to the vaccine in pregnancy um, for either the mother or the baby. Um, and we also know that the effects of COVID vaccination in pregnancy can be devastating. So I have a a good friend who's a midwife, she had a patient come in who was in labor, did not realize she was infected with COVID, gave birth, and there's a big, um, you know, shift in the immune system after delivery. Um, she ended up getting very sick and she passed away, not even having known she had COVID when she went into the hospital. So um, COVID in pregnancy is very scary, but we have, we have, you know, really no reason to think that vaccination in pregnancy is scary. Thank you very much. I know that has been a hot topic and on the minds of, of many women. Um, uh, Elizabeth is asking, can you speak to the duration of the vaccine efficacy and possible need for booster vaccines? So I, you know, I, I wish I had the answer to this question. Um, unfortunately, I don't think anybody on earth has the true answer to this question, but um, you know, some of the information that we're starting to starting to get that the vaccines provide very good protection for at least six months, um, possibly up to a year. So the patients who were vaccinated in the trials, some of them are coming up on a year um, post-vaccination. Um, I will say though that I, I would be very surprised if the COVID vaccine that I have received is the last one that I receive. So whether that is because we need a booster dose of the same vaccine, whether we're getting follow-up doses of vaccines against any of these new variants. Um, there's even a faculty in the School of Medicine at UCI who's actually working on a universal COVID vaccine. So this is very preclinical, but the idea would be that this vaccine could protect against um, you know, the current variants that we have, as well as those that may develop in the future, um, as well as other coronaviruses potentially. So um, those that cause the common cold, things like that. So I, I, I don't have the complete answer to that question. I have a lot of faith in these vaccines for you know, the first six months to a year at least, but I, I do believe we will be receiving additional follow-up vaccines in some form at some point. Thank you. Um, here's another sort of a uh, crystal ball question. <laughs> and we know um, you're giving your answers to the best of your knowledge. But like you said, we can't predict the future. Mm -hmm. um, Betta is asking, what percent of patients that you encounter receive the annual flu shots? And do you think that compliance with annual COVID shots will be likely um, enough to keep off another severe outbreak? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is a, another very big question. Um, yeah, I wish I did have that crystal ball. So in my practice, I think we ha we are very lucky that we have a, a very specific group of patients. So I practice at a, an FQHC, which is a federally qualified health center. So we have a very defined group of patients, many of whom have been our patients for a very long time. We are, you know, the they're first and foremost trusted source of healthcare in many cases. Um, and so I think because of that existing relationship, the patients that I see, I think tend to get 
flu shots at a higher rate than most, you know, than the general population. Um, I, I really would, you know, hesitate to even venture a guess whether or not compliance with an annual COVID vaccine would be better, or worse, the same um, as a flu vaccine. Um, I, I think there is a heightened awareness generally that COVID is not the flu. So, you know, we had essentially no flu season this year. And I think a lot of that had to do with masking and social distancing. And I think it's a really great indication that those things work, but also that COVID is much more, um, you know, of a wild animal than the flu. Um, it, it's very unpredictable. Um, it can be very highly contagious. Um, in settings where we're able to very easily control the flu. So, um, you know, I, I would hope that more people would be willing to receive if it were an annual vaccine, a COVID vaccine compared to the flu shot. Um, but just like the flu shot, I also think that it's very likely that, you know, once you've received one vaccine or a, a couple, three vaccines, you are, you do have some sort, uh, some level of protection against other strains. So, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, what, what exact percentage of people will need to be vaccinated for herd immunity. Um, you know, and the, the idea is that it's somewhere between, you know, 65 to 80%. Um, but that number is not, you know, a static, well-defined exact number. And there's a lot of different factors. So I think variants will be a factor. I think, um, you know, the the longevity or the durability of immunity that we see with these vaccines will be a big factor. Um, so I think, you know, herd immunity is going to be um, a moving target and kind of a fluid situation. So I don't, I don't think that directly answers your question, but hopefully it gives you a little bit to, <laughs> to ponder when you're thinking about what might happen. Bring your tarot cards the next yeah, time you have a Q&A. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you may get a meeting with Dr. Fauci if I had those. <laughs> or, or Dr. <laughs> Fauci, if you have his phone number in your, in your contacts. Um, you made such a good point about um, the peer-to-peer -peer influence that these are, um, you know, territories that sometimes friends and colleagues and family members, they've never discussed these topics before, mm -hmm. but they're really important conversations to have in, in your networks. Um, Okay, we have so many good questions here. Um, in the same vein as uh, vein, oh, that's funny, of, of getting um, the vaccine, if you had COVID a year ago, should you still get the vaccine? Yes, absolutely. So the vaccine is indicated whether you have had COVID, whether it was um, a recent infection, a you know, more long ago infection, um, there is some recommendation, and this is not necessarily a, you know, hard and fast that you must, but there is some um, information that it, that it may be okay to wait about three months after that infection, that you are very unlikely to be reinfected within that three-month time period. But we also don't have any reason to think that it will be um, harmful to receive it soon after an infection. I have a couple patients who um, had you know, the vaccine within about a month of their um, recent COVID infection. And, um, you know, from the, you know, that very limited group of patients, I, I was not able to, you know, say that they by and large have more side effects or less side effects. Um, it seems to be, you know, very similar to, uh, you know, the, the larger group of patients that I've worked with. So I think that vaccination is important, um, whether you've been, infected, whether you've not been infected, and regardless of when that infection was. Thank you. Meg is asking, um, why do you think the rollout of vaccines in the United States has been more successful and faster than other countries? Um, I think, I mean, again, this is a, this is a really big question. Um, I think there are some factors that, you know, I think Money is a probably the biggest one. Um, the fact that we have the research and the manufacturing in our country to be able to do this is another really big factor. Um, I don't like to give Trump credit for a lot of things, but I will say that I think the decision to buy large numbers of doses of different vaccines 
you know, a, a large number of different vaccines before we had any information about how well they would work was a smart decision. Um, you know, if we had just picked one vaccine um, and it didn't happen to be the one that had um, that had trials wrapping up and good efficacy data soon, we very well could still be in a position where we have no vaccines available. Um, so I think th there's a number of factors. I think you know our 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 wealth as a nation is one of them, um, and yeah, the fact that we made some some early decisions that have paid off. Um, I also I also think that we you know we've gotten lucky. Um, we happen to to have access to some of the first very effective vaccines that other countries you know didn't happen to have access to. So I think a measure of that is luck as well. So now that we're at this point in the United States and, and you said that the supply is meeting the demand, what would you recommend um, for someone who is eligible and hasn't received the vaccine yet? Any just logistical advice to getting an appointment? Um, so I think, you know, what I usually discuss with my patients is, you know, look at all the different places that you might receive it. So pretty much anywhere in your county or city that is, um, you know, not a closed site. So, you know, here in LA County, we have some sites that are reserved very specifically for specific neighborhoods or specifically for teachers. Um, of course, those things are not going to be open to the public, but, um, you know, check at, pharmacies, check at mass vaccination sites, um, major health systems. So in LA County and, um, you know, of course, in Orange County at UCI and other areas, major health systems are now able to vaccinate people who weren't necessarily their patients before. Um, so it, I think it's really just a matter of, you know, looking around and, and, you know, doing what you can to find different sources of the vaccine. I will say that I think it has become easier and it will continue to get um, somewhat easier as well. That's great news. Looking into the future again, can you share any insight on where we are in vaccinations for children? Sure, yeah. So there are trials ongoing for um, a couple of different age ranges. Um, the youngest, uh, the trial in the youngest kids is going down to the age of two. Um, I thought about signing my daughter up. She's two and a half, um, but the, I live in LA and the closest site was in Anaheim and you are required to do like nine visits. So it wasn't realistic for me, but um, for kids as young as two, we do have trials ongoing. Um, we don't have a good indication yet of results from those trials, but um, you know, just from past experience with other vaccines, I think it is very likely that at least in kids ages two and up, we will see positive results, hopefully somewhat similar to um, the efficacy and safety that we see in adults. Um, I will say, of course, just to highlight that, you know, th probably the biggest blessing of COVID is that it does not affect children to the same degree that it affects adults. Um, they, you know, are less likely to be infected, less likely to um, infect others, less likely to become very sick. And that's not to minimize, you know, the cases that have been severe in children, um, but we are working towards vaccination. And I think um, in the meantime, the, the most important thing that we as adults can do is to vaccinate ourselves because we know that children don't um, tend to infect children. They tend to be infected by adults. So if the adults in your bubble are vaccinated, that's right now your best strategy for protecting kids. Great advice, very important, thank you. So Christopher is asking a question about the, the second dose in the Pfizer and, and Moderna vaccines, if I'm understanding this correctly. He's asking, what is the difference between the first and the second shot? Is it more of the same mRNA or, or is it different? And I think he's asking this question because of the reaction that people have had to the second dose, some being severe. Sure, yeah, so the second dose is actually the exact same thing, exact same dose, um, exact same route of administration, everything compared to shot number one. Um, it is um, a vaccine series in the same way that, that other vaccines we use. So the first shot is really intended to prime the immune system. So I think of it like, that first dose is when you meet someone for the very first time. You might remember a couple things about them. 
Um, but when you get that second dose, that's when you, you know, you really get to know them. You could easily pick them out in a crowd um, and your immune system is essentially working the same way. So it becomes even more familiar with that um, antigen. Um, and the reason that we do see more or more significant side effects with the second dose is really just because of that priming effect. So your body already can recognize that antigen and mounts even a bigger response to the second dose. Um, I will say though, I always get this question that, you know, if I didn't have side effects or I had more side effects with the first dose, does that mean that it didn't work well? Um, and I will say definitely that is not the case. So we know just for vaccines in general and these ones as well, that there's a lot of variability in side effects um, between individuals, but we don't believe that there is a lot of variability in effectiveness between individuals. So um, yes, more people tend to have more side effects with the second shot, but not 100% the case. Um, and it's really just because of the immune system um, working the way that it should on that second dose. There's been so many conversations of, I was sick after the first, I was sick at the second, I wasn't at all, I had a headache. I mean, it's such a, everybody is so unique and their bodies are so different. So I have different experience for everybody. Thank you for that. Um, so many great questions. Um, Deidre has a question about um, booster shots. Um, will you need to get your next shot from the same manufacturer? In other words, if you had your first two from Pfizer, um, will you have to get the next one? whenever that is from Pfizer, or can you have another? Okay. Yeah, so this is also a really great question. So as we stand today, the recommendation is that if you got your first dose with Pfizer, you should get your second dose with Pfizer. If you got your first dose with Moderna, you should get your second dose with Moderna. Um, and the reason for that um, is just that we that's the only way they've been tested in the trial. So we do have other vaccines. So for example, some of our hepatitis A and hepatitis B vaccines where you can get you know, a first dose with one uh, manufacturer, your second and or third dose with a different manufacturer, we consider them to be interchangeable. But with these vaccines, even though they are very, very similar, we don't yet have the information to, or the, the, the trials to be able to say that you know, we know it works just as well if you mix and match compared to if you get two doses of the same type. Um, and then, of course, you know, this is not an issue with Johnson & Johnson, which only requires the, the one dose. So. Thank you. And thank you to our audience for these incredible questions. Um, we're coming up on the five minute mark. So I have two more questions I, I would like to ask you. Um, Karen is asking, is this really a vaccine? Um, she keeps hearing that it isn't a vaccine, but rather gene therapy. Is this correct or not? Okay. Yeah. So this is a, the type of question that, you know, I, I have gotten in the clinic before as well. So I will say, you know, right off the bat that this is, you know, 100% a vaccine, as true as the flu shot is a vaccine, as true as, you know, any vaccine that you've had in the past. Um, what's different about this vaccine is that, yes, it does involve genetic material. However, this is not the type of genetic material that can change or become incorporated into our own genes. It cannot alter our genes. Um, we simply don't have, and the vaccine does not have the, the the machinery that would be needed in order to actually um, put these put this material into our genes or make any sort of edits to our genes. Um, what these vaccines do is just provide that set of instructions. So that mRNA is really just a recipe, if you will. Our bodies have the machinery to read that recipe, to bake up the, the protein that our immune system then responds to. And from there, it's very similar to other vaccines. You know, our, um, we produce antibodies against that protein and then we're able to recognize it if we see the, the virus presenting that protein in the future. So this is, you know, as true as it can be, this is a vaccine and it is, would not be something to be, that's considered gene therapy. Thank you. 
Um, and looking into the future again, so we're vaccinated, we're starting to go back to work and travel. What are your thoughts about um, vaccination passports um, or proof of vaccination? Are these reliable? Um, our audience member is saying that um, there have been are rumors of sales of vaccine cards on the internet, which is disheartening to hear. Um, perhaps a national registry could be created to track vaccinations. What are your thoughts on that, Dr. Hurley? Yeah, so I mean, first off, I would say that I, I am, for the most part, a proponent of something that might be called a vaccine passport. I don't know that that's the best terminology to use, but we have, for a very long time, um, required yellow fever vaccines for certain, for travel to and from certain areas. So there is global precedence for this. Um, the idea that um, this may or may not be effective. So I think the that little card that you get when you get the vaccine, um, I almost think of that more as just, you know, FYI for you. Um, I don't consider that to be any particular official documentation. So, you know, I, I've heard some sites ask patients to fill the card out themselves, some hand it out on your way out the door. So this is not um, any sort of formal documentation. Um, but we do have in most states in the US uh, vaccine registry. So in California, um, and most states actually, a condition of receiving the COVID vaccine is that your the documentation of that dose given to you will be recorded in the state registry. So I think something like a vaccine passport, if it is to be more official, will be based on a state registry and the information coming from there because the only people who can, um, you know, talk to that registry are healthcare providers and uh, really state officials. You can request your own records, but you can't upload anything there as an individual. So there is that, that safeguard against, you know, uh, fraudulent documentation, if you will. Thank you. And the very last question from Melissa, if this recording will be shared, and the answer is yes, um, we will be sharing the recording in the follow-up email. And thank you so much, Dr. Hurley Kim. We are honored to have you as a part of the Anteater family. And on behalf of the Anteaters and Pharmacy chapter, thank you for spending your evening um, with us. It's and been fun. thank you. Oh, wonderful. And like I said, you're so great at this. So easy to understand. And we're just going to keep, keep dragging you around it's everywhere okay. we can go. Okay. We don't <laughs> because, have students quite yet, so I've got time. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And like you said, things are ever changing. So thank you for keeping us up to date and answering our questions. Um, and Wendy, shameless plug, you mentioned Giving Day. I have to say that the Anteaters and Pharmacy chapter a week from today, April 28th, on Giving Day, they are raising funds for an undergraduate student scholarship and also um, the White Coat Fund. So our inaugural cohort of our PharmD program, um, donors will be gifting their white coats and welcome um, package to them. So more on that next week. So Wendy, I turn it to you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, thank you, Meredith. And I love scholarships. That is um, so important over 40% of UC uh, students are first generation um, students and so they need your help. So that's, uh, it's really exciting. Dr. Carrie Hurley Kim, thank you so much. This was so informative. You answered so many of my personal questions uh, in, your, in your presentation. And then there were some great questions that people threw at you that um, really feel a lot more comfortable about um, everything that's out there and the media sometimes tends to, to spin us. Yep. So I appreciate that you took time for us to answer questions um, and in, with such a reliable source. So thank you once again, and thank you everybody for attending our next Anteater Wellness Wednesday. As I mentioned before, it'll be the last Wednesday of the month, which is May 26 at 7 p.m. We are still confirming the programming. And so stay tuned. You'll get some information in your email about that. 
And again, this is a chapters sponsored event through the Alumni Association. And what chapters do is it gives alumni an opportunity to stay engaged with the university for a lifetime. We do that by providing great programming like we've had tonight. So you can keep educated and learning your brain candy along the way. We also have a variety of chapters that you can be affiliated with, regional chapters, affinity chapters, academic chapters, and industry chapters. So you can get involved in that. We're recruiting right now for leadership. And so it's a recruitment season. So we will be following up with an email, as Meredith mentioned, that will include the recording of this uh, informative event. And it will also have a survey. Please fill that out. Let us know what other programming that you would like, or if there's any extra things that you would have, um, like to see tonight, um, we'd love to know. So thank you again, everyone. On behalf of the Alumni Association and UCIAA, we are um, closing out another wonderful night of Ant Eater Wellness Wednesday. Thank you, everyone, and see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Appreciate it.